right, let's go. Father in heaven, we just pray that as we meet together tonight, and no matter where we are in our walk with you, we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us toward the truth of who Jesus is and that you would speak exactly into where we are in relation to you. We pray that your word would come alive by the power of your spirit as it is proclaimed and that you would drive it home into people's hearts. We pray this in Jesus' precious and powerful name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I'm gonna read. Um, I've titled this message tonight, Your Life is a Banner for Jesus. I don't know if you drove around the corner there at MBM, but there's a, a banner there, and it says, um, it says, come as you are. And here behind we have a banner that says, Jesus. Right, I go to Penrith games, I've been to Penrith games in the past, if you're a rugby league fan, right, some people hold up banners at sporting events for the, the team that they go for, and what it's communicating is that we want to bring glory to whatever we're holding here, right? So when we want to lift up the, the banner of Jesus, we're wanting to make his name great and proclaimed across the world, and I believe that's what Paul is wanting to communicate here to the Philippian church, but also to us today, um, but you know what? It's hard to lift the banner of Jesus sometimes. It really is, hey. You know, depending on what's going on in your life currently, um, or you know, maybe your efforts in ministry, they might not be going the way that you planned. You might not be bearing fruit in what you're doing. I remember, right? So I'll share a couple of stories of me trying to invest into people and then becoming, you know, um, growing in their, their Christian faith. We uh, had a, um, when I first became a Christian, uh, when I was 22 years old. Anyone here 22 years old? Stick a hand up. No? Yeah, a couple of people. Right. All right, over there. 22 years old, and first time I'm a Christian, and I was so passionate to tell people about Jesus. I had just been gripped by the love of Christ, and I'm like, man, everyone has to follow him. So I invited all my mates over who weren't Christians, come over my house. I'm going to cook your breakfast. I'm going to open the Bible. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And about six or seven would come every fortnight, and I would do that. Uh, but, you know, over the six months that we were doing it, they begin to kind of, you know, reject the Gospels, and actually, it's not really for me, or some would begin to slip off. And, and what would happen is um, I would offer them, hey, would you like to come to church, or would you like to get in, take any steps further? And they would say no. So after a while, I was just like, oh, stuff this. You know, it's too hard. And I gave up. Another guy I met with a whole year, every fortnight, we'll call him Dylan, and every time, he had all the questions in the world about Christianity. Like, seriously, all the tricky ones. He was one of those who just kept thinking, overthinking everything. And he gets to the point, I'd try to answer all these questions. We'd open the Bible, read the Bible. And I would ask him, every time, do you want to become a Christian? And he'd say, no, every time. Until the last time we met up, he said, no, I didn't ask him. He said, hey, I'm ready to become a Christian. I'm like, fantastic, awesome. We prayed it. We um, connected him into church community. After a while, he didn't feel connected to the community. So he just kind of slipped off the radar. He stopped getting in contact with me. And then I thought, okay, maybe he's not keen. Maybe it's about me. Maybe my, my skills and maybe my abilities aren't good enough to bring him closer to Jesus. And I became really insecure. And then I gave up. So how is it that we lift up the banner of Jesus Christ in our lives when things aren't going all that well? This is my nephew. Hey, buddy. <laughs> because things aren't always going good. I mean... Think about it. Read this verse, first verse with me, verse 27. It's going to come off the screen. It says, Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. If your life's going good, that verse seems awesome. But when you're in the pits and the slum of life, this verse is difficult to read. It's difficult to apply. It's difficult to live out. Really what it's saying is live out what you believe in. So some of you might be thinking that, hey, how, Paul, how can you just say, yeah, go and live out the gospel life? Like, you don't know where I've been. You don't know the, the battles in my mind, the things that are on my heart, the things that are weighing me down. But I love that Paul, throughout this, this text, this, this passage, he still says in verse, I think it's 28. He says in verse 28, all, so he talks about the gospel life for a little while, and we'll go to that a little, bit, a little bit later, but he says in verse 28, this is a sign. It's a sign. It's a sign. Someone say sign. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. What it's saying is, the banner that you raise for Jesus is proclaiming to the world that I am a Christian. 
And what it does is it confronts the world. It gets them face to face with the reality of where they stand with Jesus Christ. And for those who haven't put their faith in Jesus, the destiny currently is destruction. But unless people can see that their destiny is destruction, how can they turn to salvation? Paul writes to this church, he's so passionate about them sticking with Jesus, living out the gospel and raising the banner of Christ to the world. I love this image. And you know why? Paul is the best guy to say this. Because he did not have an easy life. Do you know the way that this Philippian church started? It's quite incredible. In Acts chapter 16, you can write it down, go and read about it a little bit later. But I'm going to share a little bit of a story from Acts 16, how it all started. Paul gets a vision from God, like he sees God, God shows him something. It's a man that says, come to Macedonia, we need help. Macedonia is where Philippi was, which is um, around modern-day Turkey and Greece. Um, and so Paul gets his vision, and he's sent to Philippi. He goes, he's obedient, he takes his companions with him. He gets to this place in Philippi, and what has happened, he, the first day they get there, they go out to pray. And they go to the temple to pray. This is a regular prayer place that you know, the Jews would go, and, um, although they're Christians now, but they go and they want to pray for the day. And they meet this woman named Lydia. We have a Lydia at church. She's awesome. Where is she? Over there somewhere. Great. Um, Lydia's great. Lydia's a good name. But they met this woman named Lydia. And Lydia was very open to the gospel. She was a God-fearer. And when they met Paul, when she met Paul, her heart was open. Paul proclaimed the gospel to her, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then what happened is that she got saved. And then she invited them to their home. She got baptized. Her whole house got baptized. Like what we're going to do with Semi after this service. And um, they showed Paul and his companions hospitality. It started off really good. Next scene, right, they go out to pray again. How many Christians here know that every day is different in the Christian life? Paul gets up to do the same thing, but something different happens. And him and his companions go out to pray, and then they meet someone who is a fortune teller. And she's working for these men making money, but she's demon-possessed. She's overcome by an evil spirit. And she starts yelling out to Paul and his companions, these are the servants of the Most High, and they know how to get saved. Sounds like a pretty good message. I mean, if people around, like, yeah, listen to her. She's on the money. But Paul let it happen for four days, and it was very annoying. He got that annoyed after four days. Could you imagine being followed around for four days? Like, we just did launch for four days. That was a long time. But imagine someone going, oh, look at these guys, servants of the Most High. Wow, look at these Christians. Paul gets fed up. He says, come out of her evil spirit, and it leaves her. And then what happens is the people that she was working for get upset because now she can't tell the future because she's not working for Satan. And then um, what happens is they get dragged before the governors, the marketplace governors, and as they get dragged before the market, marketplace governors, they are sentenced to be beaten and whipped, just like Jesus did, was beaten and whipped, and then after that, they were put in prison. I don't know if you've ever been in prison. I haven't. I've actually been in an overnight cell for one night back in the day. It was nothing like this prison. These were horrendous prisons. But they get put in prison. Him and Silas, his mate. They get put in prison. You know what they decide to do? They decide to pray and sing to God. So they're doing that in the middle of the night. And what happens? God answers their prayer. An earthquake comes, shakes the whole jail, breaks the prison doors open, and the shackles on their wrist are set free. And the jailer is so scared, he wants to kill himself with his sword. But Paul says, don't kill yourself. And so the, the jailer runs to him, says, How must, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, trust in Jesus. He becomes a Christian right there and then. Him and his whole bap, um, household get baptized as well. And then Paul and Silas get released. But all I want to say is, that the way that this church started that Paul is writing back to, it wasn't an easy route. The Christian life is not an easy life, but my goodness, it's the best life, amen? Because we have a faithful God. And what I want to point out tonight is just some things when we're trying to raise the banner of Jesus that are going to be on your banner for Jesus. Paul talks about three things I want to pull out and draw out tonight. Is that all right? Can we do that? Awesome. Let's get to it. Number one, 
some of the words that are going to be on your banner for Christ, if you're a Christian, is this words: I am firm. And we're going to read this in um, the next verse, in verse 27. I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. It should come up on the screen. I will stand firm. Someone say firm. If you're a Christian, you've got to know, I am firm. You are firm. That means you, your faith is unshakable, right? How many people here think, man, I'm, I'm not really firm in my life. I'm a little bit shaky. Like, if something goes wrong, I'm really emotional. But, you know, this is not about feelings. It's about the truth that has set you free. It's about the gospel that has secured your salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1, the same writer, Paul... He says that the Spirit of God that is in you has guaranteed your salvation. If you're a Christian, you need to know this. This is so important. You are firm in your faith. You are standing on the cornerstone who is Jesus Christ. Your building will not collapse. And you need to know this as well. That you will withstand opposition. I know that might seem like an overpromise, but eventually you will withstand opposition. The Spirit of God will lead you to do that. Because you are a part of an unshakable kingdom. Hebrews says this, unshakable kingdom. Um, the Old Testament prophesies about Jesus coming as this eternal king that will be the king of this eternal kingdom. And this kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. That means when people come into this kingdom, meaning coming under the lordship of Jesus in their lives, they will not be kicked out. And this kingdom... Jesus says, I will continue to build until everyone in the whole world has heard about me, until it's time that I come back and take my children home. Someone say, I am firm. Come on. I am firm. I am firm. Number two, your banner as a Christian is going to say this, I have a family. Can we say that together? I have a family. Because you do, you know that, right? Jesus says, whatever you give up for me in my gospel, families and fields, etc., etc., you will not fail to receive a hundred times over in this age and the one to come. That means when you give up everything for Jesus Christ, you will join this global family. Man, you have family everywhere. Like you look around now, you've got family everywhere. Um, and it's a blessing to do the Christian life with your family, isn't it? Summer and I have been doing this 30-day challenge. Uh, Summer's my wife, if you didn't know that. Where is she? There she is, up the front here, with the youth. That's awesome. And we do this 30-day challenge, and what it is, right, so I'm not going to do it because I'm so hot, um, is we max out on push-ups and max out on dips and other exercises, right? So we just do as many as we can, and then every day after that, we do one more, and one more, and one more, and one more. And so after the 30 days, you, you'll do like 30 more than when you started, right? You grow in strength, and it's a cheeky little challenge to get you going, to get you fit. But see, there are some days, and in one week, I didn't want to do it about four times. And I literally said to Summer, stuff this, let's just go to bed. It's 11 p.m., and I don't feel like doing the 30-day challenge. She said, babe, get up. Come on, let's go. Let's do this. Let's get into it. I'm like, damn it. Okay, let's go. And then the next day came, I'm like, babe, come on, it's 11.30 p.m. I'm like, I'm tired. She knows I try to get to bed at like 10, 10.30. I'm like, I don't want to do the 30-day challenge. She's like, babe, come on, get up. We've got to do it. I'm like, okay, let's go. You see, if I was on my own, I would have given up. But with Summer around, and she is my family, she got me up. In the Christian life, there will be moments where you are down and out. But your brothers and sisters, they will pick you up off your feet. You've got to think about this, right? God could have just chosen one person to be his people, but he didn't. He chose a whole nation in the, in, in the Old Testament, a whole community. Jesus could have done his ministry on his own, surely, but he chose not to. He chose to have a family around him. And he didn't call just one person to be in his church, but a multitude of people to be in his church. There's not going to just be one Christian in heaven, but a, a multitude that no one can count in heaven. God has called us to be in a family. 
You have a family. And I think it's really important to note this because what Satan, the evil one, will try and do is divide the family and divide the house. Sometimes we don't want to do life together, amen? We're just like, man, I just couldn't think of anything worse than talking to that person. No offense, right? We're people, okay? It's true. We just got to name it for what it is. We have differences, different personalities and convictions and opinions and whatever, and that gets in the way of church life. Satan loves to use that to divide you guys. Jesus says, when you are one, then the whole world will know who I am. What a powerful statement. It's not easy to be unified, but my goodness, it's powerful. So Satan will try to divide the house. Our selfishness also gets in the way. But what we need to remember is that we have a king who is calling us constantly together. Reconciliation. He's the God of reconciliation. If you don't know this, he wants to reconcile you to himself. There is no sin in your life that God cannot forgive. He has done it already on the cross. The power of the cross has forgiven all of it. If you would come to him and believe in him. Amen? Who believes that? Anyone? Yes? That's amazing. I reckon churches should be more like gangs. No illegal activity, though. Keep the drugs out and all the other stuff and the violence. But, you know, gangs, they are so tightly knit. They are in each other's lives all the time. They will do anything for each other. If a phone call, if someone makes a phone call, they'll pick it up. What do you need? I'll be there. Let's go. They'll drop everything and run to back each other up. Churches need to be more like gangs in that way. <laughs> we have a family. You have a family. Take heart in that. Number three. But the other thing that's going to be on your banner is I am fearless. Now, who here doesn't always feel fearless? Come on. Let's be honest. Yes. Almost everyone, right? We get scared in moments. We get scared in times. The other week, I think maybe 10 days ago or so, took Summer out for dinner up the, the mountains for her birthday. And this wonderful opportunity, like, you ever have those moments where people just come to you and they start opening up and stuff? Like, the best opportunity to share Christ. And he's like, oh, look, I'm uh, kind of um, sympathetic to Christianity and all this sort of stuff, uh, but I don't believe in it. And it was very kind of like, you know, forward and harsh. And usually I'd be like, I'd say something, but I was like, yeah, you know, that's fine. That's all good. And I think a society is just great if we all get together, uh, all get along. You know, that kind of cop-out answer. I chickened out, basically. And we chicken out sometimes. But, but Paul is saying here, Paul is saying, you will not be afraid. Right? You will not be afraid without being frightened in any way with those who oppose you. That's going to be what it looks like to live out the gospel, to raise the banner of Christ. But, but what happens when we are afraid? Because some of us are afraid of conflict, so we don't share Jesus because it's going to hurt their Um, because we just don't like what's going to come back at us. Some of us don't want to hurt other people's feelings and tell them the truth. But we got to remember that our our God is a fearless God. I think we forget this sometimes. Nothing has ever been able to destroy God. He's the eternal being. He is so powerful. And because he's fearless, he's not scared of anyone. Then we have him living inside of us. There is opportunity for us to be fearless too. Did you know that? And even though you might be scared, and even though you might be insecure, we are called to be part of this fearless faith, raising the banner of Christ in this world. What an incredible proclamation. You know, um, the the apostles in Acts chapter 4, which is before kind of Paul came along, these are the apostles, right? The 12 that Jesus chose to build the later foundations for his church, they were um, threatened by the religious leaders. In Acts chapter 4, the, the believers pray, led by Peter, Lord, consider their threats. Give us boldness. They admitted that they needed boldness. Coming to the conclusion that you need boldness is a good thing. Admitting and confessing to the Lord, asking for courage is a good thing. And believe that he's going to answer that prayer in the moments that you need it. Maybe your lack of courage is tied in with your your lack of prayer. Maybe you've got to start praying a bit more about that. But you are part of this fearless faith. And it's not just for some people. 
It's for everyone. You know that, right? Everyone is called to raise the banner of Jesus Christ by the way that you speak and also by the way that you live. Raise that banner. Paul says, I'll read it out again, that this is a sign. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. Man, I just got to stop for here for a moment, and I need to address those who are not Christians here. It's going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be a bit of tension in your heart. But when I think of leaving like a church ministry for a while, like full-time church ministry, I'm like, this is what I want to leave people with, telling you the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done for you. And I'm going to look you in the eyes, and I want to tell you, Jesus Christ, this is the gospel. He came into this world from glory in heaven, stepped down, got on your level, put on human flesh, and he lived this incredible life of obedience to his Father. Some of you are trying to live an, a fully complete obedient life, but you just can't do it. Jesus did it for you. And not only Jesus did that, but his whole ministry in three, three years proclaiming the kingdom is here. He's come to call people to himself. He walked all the way to this cross in Jerusalem. And I know you've heard this before. But Jesus walks to the cross and he dies. And on that, that cross, it looks like he's been defeated. But actually, it's the greatest trick in all of history. He was bringing salvation to you. He bore your sin. You were supposed to be destroyed. He got destroyed for you. But Jesus says, you destroy this temple, pointing to himself, I'm going to raise it up in three days. And he rises from the dead. Have you ever seen anyone rise from the dead? He rises out of the tomb. He was dead for three days, but he gets up. The Spirit of God raises Christ from the dead. And the Spirit now that lives in Christians is going to raise you on the last day. And that's why you won't be destroyed. But if you are not a Christian, that is your destiny. Destruction. But I, I offer a hand of salvation now, not mine, but Jesus Christ to you today. Take it to be saved. Romans 10, 9 says, Those who believe in the hearts of Jesus did raise from the dead and proclaim that he is Lord, they will be saved. That's all it takes. Maybe you're going to do that now as, we, as, I, as I start to close my, my message. But I love, you know, this, this idea of raising the banner of Jesus because Jesus actually does this in his life, in his ministry. It's no use him trying to tell us to do it, right? Without him having done it himself because he fulfills everything. That's why we can do it because he's been there and he's able to strengthen us when we need it. I love this. Think about Jesus' life. Just think about it for a moment. He was what? Opposed by Jewish leaders. He was hated by his own people. He was abandoned by his own disciples, his family, the ones that he had around him. When it got time for the cross, they all fled. Fl uh, fled. Yes, they all fled. <laughs> oh. No one, or no, there were people who didn't trust him, people who didn't believe him. Jesus, though, he withstood opposition. He lived a fearless faith, didn't he? You know, he says in, in John's gospel, um, it's not on the screen, but he says in John's gospel, Father, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. That was his whole, that, like, that's Jesus' life in a nutshell. I want to just bring glory to the Father. I want to make him look great. I want to reveal him to the world. Jesus does this, this for us. He raised the banner of the kingdom of God. When he came, he said, I have come to preach the kingdom. I have brought the kingdom with me. And even as he went to the cross, he was still raising a banner, wasn't he? Of his own body, saying, those who come to me, I am the resurrection and the life. This is the banner. Look to me. Look to Jesus. Those words there, those letters are the five most important letters you'll ever hear in your life. Jesus Christ. And as I begin to, to close this sermon, um, the challenge for us, the challenge for us is that in the moments when we feel like 
We can't raise the banner. We've got to remember that it's got nothing to do with our own strength and ability. You know, the guy who writes this, Paul, you know what else he says in, in 2 Corinthians verse 12? He says, for, for his power is made perfect in my weakness. Admitting that you can't do it is the beginning of him doing it through you. Some of you here are continually trying to do the Christian life in your own strength. God is saying, drop the act. My power will be made perfect in your weaknesses. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm going to invite the band up. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing and I'm going to baptize Sammy. Because, you know, um, Sammy is an excellent example of this life lived with the banner of Christ. It's incredible. So many of you youth, your life, you live with the banner of Christ raised high for people to see, for people to come to Jesus. So many of you in the congregation, you do raise your banner to live for Christ. And I can't wait to just chat to Sam and we're going to find out a little bit more about her life soon. But I'm going to pray. How does that sound? And then we'll do that. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for this wonderful time that we've had tonight. You have transformed so many lives, not just in this room, not just in the launch, but in the whole world. You are working at a macro scale and a micro scale. You love the individual, you love the masses. And we want to come before you and we want to ask that you would help us to conduct our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that the world could see that Jesus is alive. That Jesus is real. That Jesus died and he raised from, from death and also he's coming back to take us home. That he will one day come in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And Father, we now, if some of us are not Christians, but we want to put our faith in Jesus, might we come to him knowing that no sin is unforgivable by God. Can we start our lives here tonight? And God, help us to do this, not with a half heart, but with a whole heart in service to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of MBM tonight said, Amen. Amen.